Hello everyone, my name is Thomas White and this is Thomas Writes, the channel where I talk about all things fantasy and sci-fi. Over the course of school, I had fallen off of reading for fun, and I started this channel to help myself get back into that habit. I've loved reading ever since growing up, and I'm also someone who aspires to write their own book. As such, I have been trying to read as much fantasy and sci-fi as possible in order to understand the genre better, to take inspiration from other authors, and to connect with other people who love these genres as well. So thank you for joining me, and I hope you enjoy the video. Just so you are aware, I made this video over a couple days, so if you notice changes in the beard length or the lighting or anything else that explains it also i do apologize if you hear cicadas outside it is texas and it is the summertime so it's kind of inevitable that we'll have this problem thank you for sitting through that introduction now on to the review has begun. The Eye of the World by Robert Jordan. Book one in the Wheel of Time series. This is a book series that I have been wanting to get into for some time. I'm hilarious, I know. The reason I wanted to get into this series is for a few different reasons. It has been highly recommended to me by people who have read it. It has been been all over my YouTube feed, people all over BookTube love this series, and it's also one of the few series that I know next to nothing about going into it. I don't know a ton about the characters, I don't know a ton about the world or the lore, and there's something about that that's really appealing to me. There are so many fantasy and sci-fi movies, shows, books, that even though I haven't read personally, I already know a fair amount about just through osmosis of the popular culture. And so I was really looking forward to getting into a series that I know next to nothing about. The story revolves around Rand, Matt, and Perrin, three boys who live in the quaint village called Two Rivers. They live peaceful, normal lives, until one day they discover that they are being hunted by a strange, dark entity. Moiraine, a woman who can wield magic, helps the boys escape from the village, and takes them on a quest to discover why they are being hunted, and in the process they discover more about who they are, and learn more about the wider world around them, and the great conflict that awaits them all. From that premise, you would probably assume that this is your typical fantasy hero's journey type stories. And the interesting thing about The Eye of the World is that it definitely relies heavily upon previously established fantasy tropes, but it takes them in some interesting and new directions. Where the characters end up at the end of the book is not where you would expect them to end up given the premise. The book may start off as your typical fantasy story, similar to Lord of the Rings, but it is going in a very different direction than Lord of the Rings went. Yes, there are chosen one heroes, yes, there is a dark lord, yes, there are people who wield magic, but it is doing so in a creative way that promises to do more with the characters than just the bare minimum. Easily the strongest part about Robert Jordan's writing style is that his world building is so in-depth, to a point that is honestly crazy. Every single innkeeper, every single town, every single city feels like a lived-in part of his world. Nothing feels like set dressing. Everything feels like a coherent part of his universe. Besides the world building, what really carried this story for me was the relationships between the characters. 
each character I liked to a certain degree. All of them had an interesting quirk about them. They all have very distinct personalities, and each contributes a unique skill to the whole group. Brandon Sanderson said that readers love to see characters who are competent. And the nice thing about this story is that each character is competent in their own way. Some are good at sword fighting, some are good at magic, some are good at healing, some are just very knowledgeable about the world and are able to aid in that way. Each character contributes something, which makes all of them feel necessary to this story. Now I'm going to go ahead and talk about each of the characters in depth, and to do that, I'm going to have to put up a spoiler warning. If you don't want spoilers for the Eye of the World, skip ahead to this time code where I will give my final rating. The first character that I have written here is Rand. Rand is just such a solid protagonist. I, I liked him quite a bit. He is kind of your typical farm boy, doesn't really want to go on an adventure, but I thought it worked well for the kind of story that Robert Jordan was trying to tell in this book. The fact that he is so reluctant to go on an adventure, that he sees so many people he loves around him get hurt because of his connections to the overarching plot of this world, it, it made him a very believable character in terms of his motivation. What I also like about Rand is he was probably the most relatable character for me. Just every decision that he made I basically agreed with that he made a lot of smart choices. He made a couple of dumb decisions like, come on man, why would you sit up on a wall to watch this ceremony going by and not think about whose wall it is? But at the same time, he's a farm boy, he's in a big city, what are you going to do? He's out of his depth, is what I'm trying to say. There is also a little bit of cliche in the fact that Rand, we know for, for a fact that Tam is not his true father, and that his father is, who knows, we don't know who his father is yet. I was pretty convinced for a little bit that Balzaman was going to be his father, but I was actually shocked that they didn't go the typical, oh, the Chosen One is the Son of the Dark Lord uh, trope. I, I was glad that Jordan avoided that. Also, the dreams that Rand would experience are just so well described. They are horrifying, but in a way that is not overbearing, not in a way that is too much, I think, for most readers to be able to handle. Rand is kind of the, the centrist of the group. He is the one who is kind of holding everything together in terms of Matt is super rebellious, he's a scoundrel, and he's being slowly taken over by this evil entity in the dagger. And Perrin is a little more on the other side, where he's a bit more shy, a bit more reluctant to do things, to take initiative. And Rand is kind of the balance in between the two other boys, which I really like about him. I also think that the way that Rand's story ends at the last chapter of this book was very appropriate, given his motivation as a character. When he discovers that he is, in fact, the dragon, he doesn't do the typical hero thing of like, okay, I'm gonna go fulfill my destiny now. No, he realizes that by being the dragon, he is putting so many other people in his life at risk, and so he chooses to run away to run from his destiny. And I think it made perfect sense, given what was set up, how much he cares for Egwene, for his other friends from the two rivers, and he doesn't want to have anything to do with what Moiraine is talking about, with these prophecies and this end of the world type talk. It, he, he doesn't want to have anything to do with it, and I can totally respect that and understand that. So overall, yes, Rand was a solid protagonist, and I'm interested to see where his journey goes next. Up next, we have Perrin. Perrin is up there with Rand in terms of one of my favorite characters in this book. Him discovering that he is a wolf brother, that he's able to communicate with wolves and interact with them and hear their thoughts. The way it was written 
and the way he discovers it is just so cool and it is just so fascinating and adds another depth of world building that is very intriguing and I'm curious to learn more about. I like the guy he meets, Elias, who teaches him about being a wolf brother and what it means. I'm curious to see if we'll get more explanation on that power in future books, which knowing Jordan, I'm sure there is more explanation that is going to be given. I also like that Perrin, he falls a little bit into the gentle giant kind of trope where he is a big, strong individual, but he is also the most shy and reserved out of the bunch. A running joke that I really like going on between Rand and Perrin is how both of them think that the other one is really good at talking to girls, and they're really both just awkward and having a hard time figuring that out. They're, they're teenagers, so it, it makes perfect sense, but it is so funny to read a chapter from Rand's section where he says, man, I wish Perrin were here. He's so good at talking to girls. And then later on to read a chapter from Perrin's section where he says, man, I wish Rand were here. He is so good at talking to girls. That's the kind of character work and character banter that I really like that I think adds a lot of fun into what otherwise would be a fairly dark story, but that adds an element of levity that really helps it along. Also, Perrin is very wise for someone his age, which I appreciate, and I like his sense of loyalty to his friends, to Egwene, to everyone that he has grown up with. He just feels like someone, kind of like Sam from Lord of the Rings. He's someone that you want by your side in a fight because he Maybe he's not the strongest fighter, but he will have your back no matter what. So overall, Perrin is great. I, I can't wait to see where he goes next in the story. Next up on the list, we have Matt. Matt was an okay character. Uh, the, I think the biggest problem with him was that he spends so much of this book possessed effectively and being corrupted by this evil dagger from Sh Shadar. Shadar? Shadar Lagoth, Lagoth, you guys are going to have to help me on the names, but he spends so much of this book possessed and evil that he becomes kind of unlikable. That being said, he takes the dagger to begin with and he, it is totally understandable why he would do that. It's, it's a cool dagger. He doesn't know what's going on. He just saw some cool shiny treasure and he took it. Totally understandable, totally relatable, especially considering that all of these main characters are teenagers. I did like how that plot point was concluded, but not entirely concluded, where Moiraine basically frees Matt of the dagger's corruption to where his personality becomes normal again but his soul or his essence is still tied to the dagger in such a way that if he separates from it, it could kill him. And so there's still this dangling pl plot point at the end of this book where they need to go to Tar Valen and Matt needs to be rid of the curse of this dagger. I'm very interested to see how that pays off how that ties into the greater conflict of this world because Matt is being set up to be a very important character moving forward. So I'm interested to see what they do with him. Overall, Matt is an okay character, even though for most of this book, he's pretty unlikable. Once his personality returns, he gets a bit better, but I'm still interested to see where he goes next. Next up, we have Egwene. I think that's how you pronounce her name. Again, I apologize in advance if I'm getting a lot of these names wrong. Robert Jordan really likes to put vowels in weird places that make you question <laughs> what sound is supposed to be made from this word, but I'm sticking with the pronunciations I'm going with. Egwene overall is an okay character. There's not a ton to her yet at this point in the story. There's a lot of 
things being set up that I think are going to pay off in later books, where she's connected to the One Power, Moiraine wants to train her to be an Ice Sedai, she has a thing for Rand, and he has a thing back, so it adds some dramatic tension. Plus, there's this prophecy that said of to Rand is that you're not going to be able to be with Egwene in the way that you want to be with her, which we'll see how that plays out. I, I like her dynamic with Perrin when they go off on their separate adventure with the traveling people. I like her carefree spirit. She's kind of the heart of the group, where she is the most optimistic and she is the one with the most hopeful outlook on everything. And every good uh, fellowship or party, whatever you want to call it, every group needs someone who is able to have that optimism, even in the middle of the, the worst possible things. I like that she's very innocent, but she's not a damsel in distress. She is someone that is still very capable on her own and is clearly shown to have power that has yet to be tapped into. So I'm very curious to see where that leads into in the future installments of this series. Overall, Egwene is a good enough character. Not a ton to her, but I'm interested to see where they go with her. Next up we have Ninave. Ninave. <laughs> Ninave? I'm going with Ninave. No, I don't know if I want to go with that. Nineveh. <laughs> Nineveh. See, this is what I'm talking about with Robert Jordan putting vowels in places where they don't make sense. I'm just going to say Nina for short, if that's okay for everyone, because I don't know how to pronounce her name. So it, maybe one of these days when I figure out how to do that, I, I will do that. The... The problem is that I don't want to look up things about the series because I'm afraid I'll run into spoilers because these books have been out for so long now. So I don't want to look up how these characters' names are pronounced. If somebody would like to leave in the comments how you pronounce her name, I would be much appreciated. But so anyway, Nina. <laughs> Nina, I did not really like her at first. I, I thought she was super arrogant and stuck up and stubborn and just getting in the way of everything and I just did not like her. She came across as super pretentious. One of the things that I liked about her character is that once you start to learn more about the world and the questionable things that the Aes Sedai have been doing, her skepticism about them and about Egwene wanting to become one of them makes a lot more sense. Especially once we get the reveals that the, the false dragons apparently are being set up by the Aes Sedai, that they are, and the gentling of men, and these very questionable tactics that they are using. It brings a new dimension to Nina that otherwise she would have just come across as just completely annoying and having no real personality of her own. Her bickering with Moiraine, again, was a bit annoying, but then once you start to learn more about Moiraine and what she stands for, it, it makes a lot more sense to why she is so skeptical and why she is so stubborn. What I also like about her is that she fiercely defends Egwene no matter what and wants her to make the best decisions for herself but she's also not going to force her into what she wants her to do. She is also called Wisdom for a reason. She is clearly very smart and very capable on her own. She just can be a little bit stuck up about it. I also really liked the scene between Nina and Lan. I, I thought that conversation was so good even though it kind of came a little bit out of nowhere, maybe I just forgot something, but I didn't get a lot of sense that there was any sort of romantic tension between the two of them. But that said, that scene just reads so well. I am not a king, Nina, just a man. A man without as much to his name as even the meanest farmer's croft. Nina's voice steadied. Some women don't ask for land or gold, just the man. Pretty good pickup line, if you ask me. Later on, 
Some men are strong enough, I know one such. If there could have been any doubt, her look left none as to whom she meant. All I have is a sword, and a war I cannot win, but can never stop fighting. I will hate the man you choose, because he is not me, and love him if he makes you smile. No woman deserves the sure knowledge of widow's black as her bride price, you least of all. He set the untouched cup on the ground and rose. I must check the horses. I felt so bad for her. <laughs> she gets friend zoned by Lan, and Lan is so awesome, and I want Lan to be happy because Lan has lost so much. We'll get into him in just a moment. But, oh man, that was just such a well written scene, and it made me sympathize for Nina so much more. So yeah, I, I'm curious to see what happens with her because she clearly doesn't like the Aes Sedai from a political standpoint, but she's also going to train with them because of the kind of power that they can offer. And I think that's going to create some interesting tension in future novels. And I don't know where it's going to go, and I'm really curious to see what happens. Next up we have Lan. Lan is another one of those characters in the book that starts out kind of typical as your typical stoic warrior type who is closed off and he's all about fighting and war and he's very cold and emotionless. It's kind of a typical fantasy trope at this point and I'm fine with it. I didn't think there was any issue with it. But what did surprise me was towards the end of the book when we get an explanation as to why Lan is the way he is. We learn that basically his whole family was slaughtered by the Trollocs, that his land was lost to the Dark One, and so now he is the crownless king who is fighting against the Dark One to reclaim the land that his family lost. Which is such a cool backstory, and it gives him a lot more depth, and gives him some more emotional stakes within the plot. Everything that went on at, is it Faldara? Faldera? I'll say Faldera. Everything that went on with at Faldera, with him and the commander, and all of the men, all of that stuff I loved. It gave a new level of depth to the world building, and it helped to raise the stakes, to show how desperate the struggle against the Dark One really is. This conversation in particular really stood out to me. What a strange thing to say, Egwene said. Why do they use it like that? Peace. When you have never known a thing except to dream, Lan replied, healing Mandarb forward, it becomes more than a talisman. That is just such a cool line that, again, it gives a whole new level of depth to the world building. And it's a good way of showing that, yeah, all of these men say peace to one another because they have never known it. And that is what they crave the most, what they want the most, is for the war with the Dark One to end. So for them to say peace, not just as a greeting, but to have this meaning behind it, is so cool. It's also an aspect of world building that I wouldn't really think about. I wouldn't really think about the greetings, the curses, and the language that heavily, but Robert Jordan gave a lot of thought to it. I also like the concept of warders, that they can use the one power to a limited degree, and that they accompany Aes Sedai around to help protect them and do their bidding. And I really like how Egwene says, well, when I become an Aes Sedai, Rand can be my warder. And it's, it's a cool, it's just cool. It's just cool. I probably use that word too much. I'll need to work on that. <laughs> so overall, yeah, Lan, another character that seems to be a little bit shallow at first, but once you got beyond the surface, turned out to be a really cool character. Next up, I have Loyal. Loyal is introduced pretty late into the story, but he is just such a fun character. He's basically a big, strong, troll-like creature, but he is a gentle giant. 
He is a scholar, first and foremost. He is super apologetic and humble and worried all of the time. He's kind of like the C-3PO of the group, where he is super smart and he is super knowledgeable, but a little bit of a scaredy cat. And <laughs> a lot of comedy comes from the fact that he is so apologetic that he speaks a lot when he should probably remain quiet on certain things. I also think that Loyal adds much needed levity to the group. There's a lot of sad things that happen in the story, but the presence of Loyal helps to keep the tone a lot lighter and helps to give the characters a, someone else to bounce off of, which is always a lot of fun. While I did enjoy the book overall, I do have some negatives. The most obvious one is the length. I mean, look at this. Look at this thing. This is like Bible-sized font. It is not a quick read. It is something that you really have to put a lot of time and dedication into completing. While the world building is very good, it can be easy to get lost, uh, especially for me, having completed this book over about a few months. It, I forgot things, there were things that I had to go back and check. Thankfully, uh, the book comes with a glossary that helps you remember all of the major people, places, and things so that you can keep track of the story better. But even so, the book's length does make it a challenge to get through. Plus, the pacing is not always the best. I would say I struggled the most in the middle chunk of this book. There's a lot of characters just moving from one location to another, and you don't get a ton of good world building in the middle portion because they're just going to different villages, and the same sort of stuff kind of happens each village that they go to. But once they get to Kaimlin, which is in the last third of this book, the plot really picks up. I was just speeding my way through it because I had to get to the end. Things got way more intriguing. All of our characters were reunited, and so we were able to see their dynamics again. And so it did end up paying off, but I will still say that that middle chunk can be a beast to get through. So just be prepared for that. This is a slow burn. It, it won't always hold your attention, but I would say it is still worth it for the payoffs we get at the end. The other gripe I have against this book is the ending. Without spoiling anything, the ending kind of comes out of nowhere. Characters start to harness abilities that hadn't really been set up well, and the conclusion to the big conflict seemed to be a little bit underwhelming, at least to me. With the way they were setting up things, it seemed to be going in a bit of a different direction than it ended up going. I do like what where the characters end up at the end of the book, but the way the conflict is resolved felt a little bit like a deus ex machina. And there's not a ton that is explained in depth as to exactly how the character was using the powers that he ends up using at the end. I would have liked a little better, clearer setup for that. And who knows, maybe in future books they will go more into that, and in retrospect it will make more sense. But at least for where I'm at in the series, it's a little confusing and a little kind of out of nowhere. Overall, I would give Robert Jordan's The Eye of the World 4 out of 5 stars. I really enjoyed this book. Despite the pacing issues and despite some of the issues I have with the plot, the world building is very interesting, all of the characters are very likable, and it ends in such a way that leaves you wanting more. I'm eager to continue the series and can't wait to see what happens next. And with that, it is time to add Robert Jordan's The Eye of the World to the book altar. I don't know if that's what I'm going to keep calling it, but I'm just going to call it that for now. My idea with it is basically to take every book that I finish reading and put it up on the book altar, and then at the end of the year, I will do a year-long review of every book that I have read that year.
I know The Wheel of Time is a very long series, so I'm going to be doing some other books in between, just so I can be putting out more reviews more consistently. Thank you all for watching, feel free to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and leave a comment down below about what books you would like to see me review next. Thanks for stopping by, and I'll see you in the next video.